OK, so I'm just going to speak a little bit about tax. And because this is, is a new section that you that you only covered in matric for the first time, for me, it's a very interesting topic. Um, definitely a topic that I love teaching, mostly because it is something new um, that's only specific to grade 12s. Um, and yeah, it's just very interesting because it's, you know, mathematical literacy is really, it's, it's, it's a real world thing that you, that you learn in mathematical literacy. And it's obviously an opportunity to, to, to learn about things that are important. So if you have a look at this question, it speaks about how an extra C has the tax rates for individuals for the 2018 and 2019 tax year. So John, who is 68 years old, and that 68 years old is extremely important. Um, the age is important because of your tax rebate. So it's very important, it's extremely crucial to make sure that you've got a highlighter or um, a different color pen just to take note of, of these little things. And as you go along, I will give you guys some tips about how to go how, about how to go about with these questions. I have mock paper too, so I do have a few tips about that as well. So as I go along, I'll just share these things with you. So first things first, he's 68 years old. So that should already give you a red flag because that means that he'll qualify for a primary rebate as well as a secondary rebate. So before I even attempt the question, I'm just making sure that I have all the facts. I also see that they have a taxable income of 2,045,364 for the 2018-2019 tax year. So that's great because that means that they the question has already worked out the taxable income for you. So in other words, it's already taken your salary, minus off your non-taxable deductions, added any fringe benefits and multiplied it by 12. It's already done all those steps for us. So we already have the information that we need. Um, that we can take to the tax table. So that's that's great. That means that the question is already a little bit easier for us. The next part of the question also says that he paid a monthly contribution towards a medical scheme for himself as well as his wife. So medical aid is important. And the reason why it's important is because you also qualify for a medical scheme tax rebate. So in other words, if you're contributing towards a medical aid, that means that you qualify for the tax rebate. This is a new thing. So if you do old papers um, that have tax questions in it and you notice there's nothing about medical aid, it's because it's it's a more recent thing that's come into, into um, tax. Great. OK, so like I said, the fact that he's 68 years old, that should have told you, wait a minute, he has a tax rebate, but he was going to qualify for the primary as well as a secondary rebate. And the fact that he's contributing towards a um, medical aid is also going to be very important. OK, so let's dive in. Let's have a look at the question um, and let's see how we can go about this. So the first question is asking us to calculate John's total medical scheme tax rebate for the year. So already I was expecting a question like this because of the information above. So the medical, the, the, the medical scheme tax rebate for the year, that's very important. The fact that they're asking you for the year. Um, and I'm quite glad they're asking us this question because the medical scheme tax rebates, which is given to you in a test or an exam. I'm just going to just show you over here. So the medical scheme tax rebates, as you can see here, it's for the month. That means that all these amounts are monthly. That poses a little bit of a problem because, as you know, tax is an annual thing. We do it for the year. So every time you work with tax, it's always for the year. But now the medical scheme tax rebate is for the month. So this is extremely important because you need to go and multiply these values by 12. So if you go back to the beginning of the question, it says that he is contributing towards a medical scheme but he's contributing towards a medical scheme for himself, but also for his wife. That means that he will qualify for the 310 Rand for himself, as well as 310 Rand for his wife. So he is getting 620 Rand. I hope you're all understanding where I'm getting 620 Rand from. So it's the 310 Rand for him, as well as the 310 Rand for his wife. So he's actually going to get 620 Rand, 
But if we go back to the question, the question is asking for the year. So it was nice that they mentioned for the year, just to remind you that you need to then go and multiply it by 12. So that is why the question is asking for three marks, because there is quite a few things that you need to do here. So if we go and we have a look at the memo, I just want to cover the second part of the memo. So if you had to go and have a look here at the memo, this is now where the three marks is coming from. So the first mark is an RT mark. So basically that's taking the information from the table. So you're transferring the information correctly. So that's where the 310 rand is coming from. So there'll be a mark allocated for that. And when you're working through past papers, um, my advice to you is to make sure that not only do you, when you mark it, that you not only look at the answer, but you also have a look at why the marks are being given. Because sometimes you see a question for three marks and you start panicking because you don't understand, like, why is it three marks for this question? But if you have to actually go and have a look at the breakdown of where the different marks are coming from, then it'll start making sense. And I've seen this in my classroom as well, that the learners actually start realizing they, they, they sort of know where the marks are allocated before I've even explained to them where the marks is allocated. So the first mark that we're allocating is the 310 Rand. So that is getting it from the table. The second mark is a method accuracy mark. So that means that it has to be correct in order to get that mark. So that method accuracy mark is for multiplying. So in other words, you're multiplying by two because it's for himself and for his wife. And then you're multiplying by 12 because it's for the year. And then you'll see the answer is a CA answer. So this means that if, for example, you didn't read the fact that he had a wife, so you just took 310 Rand and you multiplied it by 12, you'll forfeit that mark, that second mark. So you'll get the first RT mark for getting the 310 Rand, but then you'll forfeit that mark, and that's why it's specifically a method accuracy mark. So if you've just times by 12, then you'll get your answer. Um, let's just have a look, what is the answer? And you'll get 3,720 Rand. So then you'll still get that CA mark over there, the second mark. So you can still qualify for two out of the three. Something else that's extremely important to notice here is that answer only. So if you just wrote the answer, so you just worked it out in your calculator and you got 7,440, you will get all three marks. This is great for you, but also if you make mistakes, for example, if you just multiplied 310 Rand by 12 and you got 3,720, but you didn't show any calculations and you just wrote 3,720, you're going to get zero out of three for this question. But had you shown your steps, you could still qualify for two out of three. So this is why we encourage you to show all your steps. So yes, there are marks allocated for just writing down the answer, but this is definitely something that I would not advise. Right. The next uh, question is for eight marks. Now, I know how much learners love answering these long amount of marks questions. So, like I said, this is tax. So, you are going to receive a question like this in your final, definitely. I mean, it's a new topic. So, please practice these questions. So, this is eight marks. So, it says, hence, calculate the total amount of income tax that you had to pay for the 2018-2019 tax year. So, there are quite a few steps that you need to follow with your tax. Um, and basically all you need to do with it is very easy is you need to take your salary that you get for the month. You need to multiply it by 12. You need to add any um, fringe benefits to this. And then you need to minus any non-taxable deductions. So things that are not, um, that cannot be taxed on. So for example, you minus your pension uh, for the month, for the month out as well. So that's already been done in the 2,045,364 rand. So those steps has already been done for you. That means that we can go straight to the tax table. So if we go straight to the tax table, again, something new in grade 12, basically like a step tariff. Okay. So, this is your tax year, specifically for 1 March 2018 to 28th of February 2019. So this individual, John, he is getting 2,045,364. So that means that he is earning a lot of a lot of money, first of all. So he is in the last brackets, okay? 
So that means that, sorry, I'm just making sure that this thing is in focus. There we go. Okay, so this means that he is going to be in the last step, the last tax bracket, okay? So that means that he is qualified to earn that amount. So that means that he is expected to pay over to SARS a fixed amount of 532,041 Rand plus 45% of the taxable income above 1.5 million. So this means that he has to pay a fixed fee of 532,041 Rand, but everything that he earns above 1.5 million, he will have to spend an extra 45% of that total. So this is basically just enabling all individuals in South Africa to pay the same amount for what they are earning. And once they get to the next level, they will then qualify for the next amount. So if you have to go to the answer, okay, there is the 532,041. All right, that is an accuracy mark. And the way you're getting that from again is for getting it from the correct tax bracket, okay? So that's over there. The second one over there is for realizing that you need to minus the 2 million and the 1.5 million. So that amount that's extra, minusing those two values, the amount that's extra, you'll then have to pay 45% of. So John will have to pay the 532,041 Rand, but then he also has to pay 45% of the difference between those two values. So if you minus those two values, which I'm sure you can do without a calculator, if you minus those two values, you're going to get a total of 545,364. Okay, so this is important because this is the amount that John earns above 1.5 million. So if you and a classmate are both earning 1.5 million Rand a year, which is awesome by the way, then you will basically both pay the 532,041 Rand. But let's say, for example, now you worked a little bit harder and you suddenly got 1.6 million for the year, but your classmates still got 1.5 million for the year. Then both of you would still pay the 532,041 Rand, but then you would pay 45% of the 100,000 Rand extra that you are earning. So that is how the, the tax system keeps everyone equal. So John is having to pay the 45% on the 545,365 Rand, that, sorry, 64 Rand that he's earning extra, which means that he's got a total that he needs to pay over to SARS of 777,454 Rand and 80 cents. Okay, shame, it's a lot of tax. Right, so now we need to be reminded now that before you pay that over to tax, you also get a tax rebate. So because John is 68, he is going to qualify for both the primary as well as the secondary rebates. Okay, so the primary rebate is 14,067 Rand and the secondary rebate is 7,713 Rand. Now, this can obviously differ because it all depends on which tax table they give you and for what year they give you. So if they give you a 2020 tax table, Obviously, these values might differ slightly. Maybe they give you one from two, three years ago. So don't be, um, don't stress if, if the value is slightly different. Don't be used to this the 14,067 Rand. Let's say you've practiced um, this question quite a few times with different amounts. So don't, you know, put the 14,067 Rand into your head because it might be different in the tax table. So the 14,067 Rand, but then you also need to remember that because he's older than 65, he's going to get both. That is extremely important, is that John is qualifying for both the primary as well as the secondary tax rebate. Some learners, they go and they only minus the 7,713 Rand because of the wording of the tax table. The tax table is saying secondary is 65 and older, but you need to remember that he's getting the primary as well as the secondary. So John is qualifying for both the primary and the secondary. If he was older than 75, then he would obviously qualify for the tertiary amount as well. Okay, so we're going to minus 
the 14,067, we're going to minus the 7,713, and then we are going to get an answer of 755674.80. So again, let's have a quick look at the descriptors. So the first one is a method mark for subtracting the rebates, and then the second mark is a method accuracy mark for both the correct values. So again, if you didn't write both of them down, you would forfeit one of the marks as well. And then your question 2.2.1's answer is now going to fall into here. So you're going to minus the 7,440 Rand as well, and you're going to get a total of 748,234 Rand and 80 cents that John needs to pay over to SARS. Now, again, it's a CA answer. So all of this will be carried down with your mistakes. So if you had gone and made a few mistakes over here, for example, you don't need to give up because there are still quite a few more steps that you can get. So if you made a mistake here for some reason, maybe you did what I did by mistake and you wrote 545365. Five, so obviously this answer would be slightly different, but you still went and you minus your two rebates, you minus your medical aid tax credit, you're going to still get that CA mark there. So you just forfeit one or two marks over here, but then the rest of the marks will still get as well. So with tax, it's very important to follow through. With tax, it's also very important to make sure that you know the steps. Some learners go and they minus the rebate from the salary. Um, they add the pension on. They do very strange things. So with taxation, the steps stay the same. So yes, the question is going to be different. Um, it won't necessarily be that he's earning 2 million rand. Maybe he's only earning 400,000 for the year. They might give you a monthly amount. They might give you 50,000 rand per month. They might say that John has a wife and one child. So it's going to change, but your steps are still going to be the same. So it's so important to make sure that you study these steps off by heart. So you make sure you take your salary, you multiply it by 12, you minus your pension fund, you add any other um, um, things that can be added um, to your tax. You can minus anything else that needs to be minus. You then get your amount that you take to the tax table, you put it into the tax table, you minus your rebates, and then you go. So. So yeah, the, the steps do remain the same. Screen over here. So let's say, for example, you only put the 7,713, you only minus that value, then you're going to lose that mark over there, that method accuracy mark. Because you can see there in the descriptors, it's saying method accuracy for both correct values. So if you left out that one, then you just lose that one mark, and obviously they would still carry on and give you the mark. So you'd lose one mark out of the eight. And now I might just have to zoom out a little bit first. All right, so this is a question from 2018 November paper one. So we shouldn't struggle with this too much. So remember in the past, your paper one was your more level one type questions. So I don't want to tongue in cheek, I suppose, and say that it's a bit easier. Paper one is a little bit easier, um, but that was because there was a lot more level one questions in it and no level four questions. Um, so you should find that this question is a little bit easier. We can also just chat about the levels as we go along. Okay, so this is an inflation question, but it also has a graph. Okay, so once again, it's so important to make sure that you have a look at all the information before you jump into the question. So I'm seeing a graph here and I'm seeing um, a, va a value of a trolley that's costing a thousand rand in 2015. Okay, so if you have a look there at your X axis, you've got your years. So that's ranging from 1965 all the way to, to, to 2015. Please just if you have any questions, you're more than welcome to interrupt me as I go along. We don't have to wait until the end. Okay, so the values is also given to you there, the 14 rand, for example. I'm just going to highlight it. 26 Rand, 85 Rand. So the values are given to you on the graph. And the reason why the values is given to you on the graph is because, as you can see there, the x axis, uh, the y axis, sorry, um, the values goes up in 100. So it's a little bit difficult to estimate, you know, what the price would have been at that stage. So this is why they've given you the values for this. Um, if you have a look at the 1,000 Rand one, you can clearly see that the 1,000 Rand for 2015, you can clearly see that it's hitting at 1,000 Rand, for example. But something like, um, you know, this 1995, the 200 
91 Rand, if you go and have a look along the y axis, it's slightly below 300. So one learner might say 280 Rand, one learner might say 295 Rand, for example. So this is why they've given us the values. Okay. So there's the graph, and then there's also certain South African items and their prices for the years 1970 and 2015. Okay, let me quickly just zoom out again. Okay, so there is a Spur burger, which I wish still cost 30 cents, or shall I rather say 62 and 90 cents, actually. Okay, so there's your Spur burger, your cheddar malt steak, your coffee, and your Nestle condensed milk. So these are just all prices. Um, ranging from 1970 and then going up to 2015. So I sort of have an idea with what's going on in this graph and now I can read the questions and see if what I've learned so far might just help me to answer some of the questions. So the first question says that you need to explain the term inflation within the given context. Okay, so inflation, you need to have a look at the reason why they're using the words within the given context. It's so important within the given context is because some sometimes a word might have a different definition, but obviously they want you to answer it in the ter in terms of mathematical literacy. So if you have to have a look at this picture, the, the, the graph is speaking about how the value of a trolley is increasing. So that is pretty much what the definition is of inflation. It's an increase. Um, let's get the memo here quickly. Okay. So it's a percentage increase of price over a period of time. Okay, so it's an increase in the price of goods and services over a period of time. So that is pretty much what inflation is. So obviously it's not, you don't have to specifically write it that way, but it is good to have an idea of various definitions. So for example, to know that, that inflation is an average increase of goods and services over a period of time or over the, over the years, whatever. So what they're specifically looking for here is the fact that the learner understood that it's an increase of the price and also over a period of time. That's very important. They always want that two part um, aspect. So the increase of price and then the second part is over a period of time. The next question is asking us to write down the price of a Spur burger in 1970. Let's just quickly zoom in on the questions again for those who wanted me to zoom in. Okay, so we're going to write down the price of a Spur burger in 1970. So that is just simply reading off of the table above because as you can see over there, there is 1970 and there is our 30 cents for, for the burger. So this is a level one question. So all you're doing is you're simply just taking it off of, of the picture. Um, my learners often ask me, ma'am, why don't we have one mark questions in mathematical literacy? Why is this question two marks? Because sometimes you see the thing for two marks and you wonder, is it really that simple? Um, but if you think about it, it's two marks because there is a little bit of work that has to go, go into this question. So the first thing you need to do is you need to go and see, okay, it's Here's my table. So you have to first go and find the table from, from the question paper. The second thing that you have to go and find is your Spur burger. So there's my Spur burger. The next thing you have to go find is 1970. So there's 1970. So there we go. There's my 30 cents. So there is a little bit of work that you need to put in um, in order to get those two marks. So that's why we have two mark questions as well, because of the effort that you need to make. The next one, 2.2.3. Calculate by how much the cost in rand of a trolley has increased from 2000 to 2005. So again, we need to first have a look. We need to go and find our 2000 and we need to go and find our 2005. So if we just go back to our graph, which is over there. All right, so there is our 557 Rand and there is our 418 Rand and you just have to go and minus the two values from one another. So you're going to take the 557, you're going to minus the 418 and then you're going to get a total of 139 Rand. Okay, so again, let's just spend a little bit of time looking at these descriptors. I really find it to be so important. So this is a level one question. OK, because all you're doing is you're just looking for the two different years. So you're trying to go and find the 557 Rand. 
you needed to go and find the 418 rand and then you get a total of 139 rand. So again, answer only, you'll get all three marks. So if you just wrote 139 rand, you'll get three out of three for this question. Again, it's all good, but if you write down wrong, you're going to lose three marks. So again, I'm just encouraging all of you to make sure that you show all your steps when you're writing your papers. So you're going to get your mark for getting the correct amount. You're going to get a method mark for subtracting. And then you're also going to then get a CA mark for your final answer. Now, again, look at what it says there. One of the two values must be correct. So if you got two completely different values, you can't get that CA. Then unfortunately, you're going to get zero for this question. So it needs to be that one of the values is correct. So you got the 557, but you didn't get the 480, then you can still get the two out of three. So that's very important. Okay. The next question is asking us to calculate the percentage increase. And I see that they actually gave you the formula, which is very nice of them, but you don't always get this formula in the test. So please make sure that you know this formula. Um, we do do it in grade, grade eight and nine, very basic. Um, but in grade 10, we do spend quite a bit of time on, on this, on percentage change, especially. So the increase, the decrease, as well as then the percentage change. So please make sure that you know this formula, okay, because you might not necessarily get it in a question paper. So the percentage increase is the new amount minus the original amount divided by the original amount multiplied by 100. Maybe you've heard new minus old over old times 100, okay? Now, something that's also very important that I'm seeing over here is this percentage sign, the 100%, okay? So please, when you type this in on your calculator, do not put in that percentage sign. That percentage sign there is just a symbol. So if you're going to go and you're going to put it in your calculator, it's going to change your answer. So I'll show you exactly what I mean. So the percentage increase of Rick Coffee from 1970 to 2015. So if you have to go and have a look now to Rick Coffee, okay, and again, the answer itself is actually quite scary. Um, you have to first go and find Rick Coffee on your table. So there's Rick Coffee, okay, 75 Rand in 2015 versus 25 cents in 1970. It's no wonder our parents are so angry. Everything is so expensive nowadays. Okay, so 75 Rand in 2015 versus 25 cents. So you now have to go and substitute those values into the formula. So obviously the new amount will be the 75 Rand. The original amount will be the 25 cents divided by the original amount, which will also be 25 um, cents. And then we need to multiply it by 100, not 100 percent. I'm putting the percentage symbol in on the calculator. Please do not do that. You're going to change your answer. So if you have a look at how to do it in terms of the memo. OK, the second way of doing it is very scary. Um, <laughs> OK, so you're going to take your 75 minus your 25 cents divided by your 25 cents multiplied by 100 and you're going to get 29,900 percent. Now, I'm sure already you're thinking, oh, my word, but we don't get more than 100 percent. You do get more than 100 percent. So maybe not in a test, um, but in life you can get more than 100 percent. I mean, think of um, clothing items, you know, you, you they buy it for 100 rand and they sell it for 800 rand. That's more than 100 percent profit on the pants. So it is possible to get more than 100%. So this answer is 29,900%. So it's yes, quite a, a drastic or dramatic increase from 1970 to 2015. Um, but yes, it is possible. So I'm sure many of the learners probably went and they went and they read this calculation a few times and they probably maybe even went and divided by 100 a couple of times and probably went, then went to like 29.9% for argument's sake. So, yes, it is possible. So, and I mean, think about it. You've gone from 25 cents up to 75, and that is a very big um, change in price. Um, the second way of doing it as well, I would say this is a little bit more um, for the mathematics learners that went over. So, basically, what they're doing is they're working out that it is 75 divided by 0, 0,25 multiplied by 100 gives them 30,000, but then they're minusing that 100%. And then they're getting 29,900. So like I said, it's that's a little bit more of a, a different way, a different approach 
um, of doing this question. Um, yeah, so if you go and you put the 100% in on your calculator, it's going to change your answer. So please just make sure that you don't do it like that. Um, my hands are so freezing at the moment. Let me just quickly type it in for you. Okay, so as you can see here, I've typed it in on my calculator. I hope you can see. Um, so I've done the 75 minus the 25 cents divided by the 25 cents and then multiplied by 100%. So as you can see, now I've got 299, which is what a lot of the learners would have written as their answer. So the reason why it's doing that is because of that percentage sign that you're putting there. So if you have to go and take the percentage sign away, there we go. Okay, so what's happening is by putting that percentage sign there, percentage means divide by 100. So when you're putting that percentage sign there, what's actually happening is it's saying, if I delete that, it's saying 100 divided by 100. So it's actually changing your sum to this. Because remember, percentage is anything divided by 100. So that's what it's actually doing. So now 100 divided by 100 is 1. So it's timesing your answer by 1, which is why the 299 happens. So when you go and you take that answer and you multiply by 100, you then get the 29,900. So that's what's happening. It's timesing your answer by 1 instead of timesing your answer by 100. And that is why there's a difference. So please, that percentage sign, please just make sure that you ignore it. You just take it as a unit of measurement, as a symbol. Very, very important. OK. And then the last question um, regarding inflation. OK, so a cheddar malt steak was sold for 104 Rand and 90 cents at a percentage profit of 17.5% determine the cost price. OK, so you want the original cost price for this steak. So the fact that it was sold for 104 Rand 90 cents, that is the selling price. OK, so this is the selling price. I'm actually just going to move over to a piece of folio because this is also a very important section. Um, we are seeing it in paper two where the learners get zero out of three for these type of questions because they don't understand the concepts. OK, so the 104 Rand. And 90 cents is how much they are selling the cheddar malt steak for. So this is the selling price now. If you go back to your grade nine EMS days, and those of you that's taking accounting currently, if you go into your accounting class, or those of you that don't take accounting, you go back into your EMS days, you will remember, or hopefully you will remember, that you have your cost price, you have a profit, and then from there, you are going to get a selling price. So the cost price, we don't know what it is. That's what we're trying to work out. We do know the percentage that it is. And the percentage that it is, is 100%. Okay, so you've got your product, you bought your product, but remember, you need to pay the person back that you bought the product from. So if you bought something for 50 Rand and you add on a profit of, you know, 20% or whatever the case is, you need to still pay that guy back his 50 Rand and then you can obviously take the profit for you. So that's why the cost price is set at 100% because that's how much you bought it from, from your supplier. So... The cost price is 100%, the profit is 17.5%, and then the selling price is 117.5%. I hope this is making sense. Um, a lot of you should kind of recognize this from VAT as well, VAT inclusive, VAT exclusive. Your exclusive price will be the 100%, and your inclusive price will be the 115%. So if we um, use another formula, and I'm big into formulas, um, the formula that you can use, and I teach this with the VAT section as well, is that you take your price and you multiply it by what I want. And again, I hope some of you know this formula. And you divide it by what I have. So you take your price, you times it by what you want, and you divide it by what I have. So if you go back to the question, the question is asking us for the cost price. So they want the cost price, and what we have is this price over here. So what price do we have there? We've got the 104 and 90 cents. And as I showed you on top here, the 104 and 90 cents is my selling price. So I've got my selling price. So what I want is I want the 100%. I want to work out what the original value is, the original 100%. 
and what I have is the 117.5%. So if I take my price, the 104 rand and 90 cents, just move it up a little bit, and I multiply it by what I want, which is the 100%, and I divide it by what I have, which is 117.5%, I'm then going to get a total of 89 Rand 28. So that is the cost price that they want. So this is um, a level two question. Okay, so 89 Rand 28 cents. Now, something that I don't want you to do because it's completely wrong and you're going to get naught um, for this question is what the learners tend to do is they take the 104 Rand Please don't do this. I'd actually say rather ignore me as I'm talking right now. Um, what they do is they say, okay, cool. So 104.90 and then they multiply the 17.5%. Please don't do this. <laughs> so 104.90, they multiply it by the 17.5% and they get a total of 18,3575. And then they say, okay, cool, but I want the cost price, so I need to minus it from it. So I'm minus the 1835.75, 104.90 minus the answer. Let me see. There we go. I just want you to see that the answer is going to be different. And you get 86,5425. Okay, so as you can see, this is not the same answer as the previous one. So 89 and 28 versus 86 and 54 cents. So these two answers is not the same. And the reason why it's not the same is you're timesing the 17.5% by the 104.90%. So you're trying to work out profit on something that has already got the profit including uh, included into it. This will only work if you had to have the price without profit first. So you're trying to work out the selling price, for example, which you then add on. So it's very important. If you want to go this route, you want to say 104 multiplied by 17.5 and you want to minus it out. You can do it like that, but what's very important is that the 17.5%, it cannot be 17.5 over 100, okay? That's not where the problem is, because if you go back to what I want over what I have, what you want is your profit percentage, but what you have is the 100%, which is what you don't have. You've actually got the 117.5%. So if you're going to go this route where you'd rather minus, you, I don't know, you don't feel comfortable with this formula or whatever the case is, and you prefer to rather multiply and minus it out, you can do it that way, but you cannot multiply it by 17.5 over 100. You have to multiply it by 17.5 over 117.5. Okay, and I'm sure this is ringing some bells with a VAT exclusive and inclusive price. Um, so yeah, that's very important. And the reason why we need to divide it by 117.5 and not 100 like over here is because of that 104.90. That 104.90 is the selling price, which means it has the 17.5% included in it already. So if you go back to the formula, if you do it this route, by the way, then it will work if you put it over the 117. Then you will get to the same answer of the 89.28. Okay, so what is important to note about this formula, which I hope you're all writing down, is that the price, the one that you're multiplying, it must match the bottom, the denominator, the what I have. And that's what's important. So the price multiplied by what I want divided by what I have. So what I have is the selling price, which is the 117.5%. Okay, so that is the inflation section. So I'm just going to open up again. Is there anyone that has a question specific um, to the inflation part? If not, then I'm going to move on to exchange rates. Um, okay, so exchange rates. So let's first have a look at what is an exchange rate. Okay, so an exchange rate is... You know, in simple terms, an amount that you pay in, in one particular currency for another currency. And again, it's quite an easy way to accomplish this section. Um, there's steps that you can follow to, to, to battle this section of work. So again, 
Finance is definitely the, the better answered topics in mathematical literacy as well as data, actually. So I really do have high hopes for, for paper one. So this is the, the nicer section of work. Um, I love teaching finance, to be honest, as well as data. But finance is definitely one of my favorite um, topics to teach. OK, so if you have a look at this question, that's from 2018, February, March. Um, John told his friend Errol, who lives in Botswana, about the profit to be made when he sold the ultra thin mouse. OK, so these stories are seeming a little bit random. It's obviously not because it's um, snippets out of different question papers. So immediately when I saw this question, funny enough, I was like, oh, my word, like this table, shame. This is not the nicest way to, to put um, exchange rates or an exchange rates question because it is quite complicated. But there's ways to uncomplicate it. So let's have a look. OK. Errol decided to join John as a business partner. Um, pretty useless information for, for right now. I always say that it's the extra bits that they talk about. So that's, I mean, mathematical literacy is all about reading. Um, so the fact that they're business partners is very exciting, but not going to really help us yet. OK, so John and Errol are then deciding to share their profit in the ratio three to two. OK, awesome. So a profit ratio in the ratio three to two. So that tells me that I need to go back to grade eight. And remember how my teacher taught me how to share in a ratio. Um, because this section, <laughs> we don't really spend time on it in grade 12. I mean, in grade 12, you're so focused on, oh, it's the finals and prelims and, you know, and the old the old way of doing things, I suppose. It was matric dance and all that, all that jazz. The last thing we thought about was teaching ratios. Um, and then ratio questions sneak in. So please, you know, go back to your grade 10 workbook if you still have it and make sure that you practice some of these random things because they always pop in when you least expect it. Um, like sharing in a ratio, for example. Um, so that's you know, a nice little surprise for some of you, I'm sure. OK, so there's my table. And I'm sure many of you are thinking, what the heck is going on in this table? I'll set to read it a few times, don't worry. OK, so there's a whole bunch of different um, currencies that's listed there. Some of them are probably pretty useless, but we can have a look at it anyway. And then the first column says units per czar, which in case if you didn't know, it's our rand. And then the second column is the rands per unit. So in other words, the first column, like I said, I had to read it a few times, so don't worry if you're confused. Um, one, one of our rands gets us 9,5467.85. Um, of the Algerian um, dinars. And then one of our rands gets 0, 0.797782. So that's why I just wrote there. I don't know if you can see it. I just made a little note for myself that one rand is equal to one of the um, units. Okay. So if I have one rand, that's how many I get from Algeria. That's how many I get from Botswana. That's how many I get from Brazil. That's how many I get from British Pound. One of my rands gets me 2,72 rupees, and one of my rands gets me 9,11 yen. So, I just want to get my highlighter quickly here. So, one of my rands gets nine of these, two of these, nine of these. So, here, the rand is quite strong. But then, one of my rands does not get a full puller. One of my rands does not get a full Brazilian real, and one of my rands, as we all know, does not get me a pound. So these ones, the rand is a bit weaker. The second column is now obviously the other way around. OK, so that's now switched around. So one dinars gives me 0, 0,104 rand. So it's the other way around now. OK, so I hope that helps a little bit. So let's just go through the questions. OK. So the first question is to write down the exchange rate between the Botswana puller and the South African rand. So this is basically, they're trying to see, do you understand what you're reading from the table? So this is a level one question because you're just actually taking it from the table. But I think the reason why they're asking us this question is because they want you to actually go and explore what the table is telling us. Okay, so the exchange rate between the Botswana puller and the South African rand is over there. So that's the second row. And now basically it doesn't matter which one you write down. OK, they didn't tell us like in reference to vans or in reference to pullers. So in this case, it doesn't matter which one you write down. So there is the answer over there. So one rand is equal to 0, 0.797782 Botswana puller or one Botswana puller gives us one rand 25, 3, 4, 7, 5 cents. OK, 
So you can see there's two different ways that you could have written it down, and either way you would have gotten both of your marks. All right. The next question I've already basically answered. Okay. This the currencies which are weaker than the rand. Okay. So which ones are weaker than the rand? And that's going to be my green ones. Okay. Because remember, one of my rands doesn't get a full unit of theirs. So that means that I'm going to be a little bit less happy if I go and visit those countries. Okay, so it is the rupee, the dinar, and the yen. Okay, now again, level one question. Okay, and then they're also telling us they accept the currency values or name of the currency a maximum of two marks. So in other words, some of the learners went and they probably wrote down 0,79, um, 7782, 0, 0, 262231, and then 0, 0, 05, um, 9861. So those learners will only get two out of the three. And the reason why is because they're asking us to list the currency. So if you have a look, there's the word currency. So they wanted this column to be mentioned. They didn't ask for the units per czar. And then um, they're also saying if you wrote down the name of the country, then you get only two marks. Again, because the question didn't ask for the country, they asked for the currency. So if the learners went and they wrote, um, Botswana, Brazil, and England. And then they can only get um, two marks, okay? Because they didn't answer what the question asked, but they don't want to be rude and only give you, you know, give you zero out of three for that question because the learner must have had some insight in in what to do. Okay, then the next question. Two point three point three. Each mask costs thirteen rand and is sold for 48 Botswana, Botswana pullers, okay? So the first thing you have to do is you have to convert 13 Rand into the pullers. So you've already done this in the first question by writing down the exchange rates. Okay, so if you have a look here, there's again, there's two ways of doing it depending on which exchange rate that you used. If you decided to use the first exchange rate, which is one Rand is equal to 0.7977, then you're going to multiply it. And then if you decide to go the other route, then you need to divide it. And I, again, I'm just want to spend a little bit of time here because this is such a, a nice um, formula or, or method that we can do. OK, so if I go back to my folio. All right, so the way I normally do it, the way I teach my kids, is um, I first tell them that they need to write down the exchange rate from the question. So again, it doesn't matter how this question gets asked in the end of the year. If you follow these steps, um, then there's no reason why you can't get these marks. So the first thing you need to do, the first step is you need to write down um, the exchange rate that's given to you in the question. Oh, I've forgotten how to write after being on a holiday now. So you need to write down the exchange rate. Okay, so we're going to write down the exchange rate as given in the question. Sorry, it's just trying to focus here. Yeah? Okay, there we go. So we're going to write down the exchange rate as given in the question. So that is straight from the question. So sometimes they'll give it to you in the question itself. So let's say convert 13 Rand into Botswana Pula if the Rand is 12 Rand or whatever. And then sometimes I'll give it to you on the top like they've done with this question, but not in a table format, just literally giving you an exchange rate. So again, it doesn't matter which one we use. OK, so if we're going to use the one rand, so in other words, the rand is the subject of the formula. The one rand is equal to the 0, 0,7977782. Okay, so we're going to or you could have used the other one. I'll do both just so you can see that it works. So that's the first step is that you need to write down the exchange rate as given in the question. The second step that you're going to do is you're going to line up the units of measurement. OK, so that, or in this case, I suppose I should rather say you need to line up the exchange rates. So now you're going to read the question. The question is asking us to convert to the 13 rand. So the second step is we're going to line up the exchange rates. So in this case, we're going to put the rands under the rands. This is now what the question is asking us. So the 13 round, in other words. OK, 
Okay, so we need to line up our currencies. Okay. And then what we do, again, if those learners online that's probably watching, they're going to say new over old times, lonely one, man. Okay, so your third step is new over old times by the lonely one. Okay, so what I mean by new and old, so the new one is basically the one that you're trying to work out, okay, the one that was given to you in the question that's asked, uh, that they're asking you for. So I suppose if you really wanted to, you can change it to asking for divided by given times lonely. So ask divided by given times lonely, if you want to go that route rather. So the new one is the one without a partner, in other words. The old one is the one that was given in a test or an exam. And then the lonely one is the one that you're multiplying by itself. So in other words, you're going to say 13 over 1 multiplied by the 0, 0,7977821. And then you get an answer of, uh, where is it now? 10,37. Okay, I know um, some, some schools do something called the LVN method, which is also very similar. Okay, you always start on the right-hand side, and then you're going to go anti-clockwise, and you say, always say, divide and times. Okay, that is another way of doing it as well. Okay, the LVN method. Okay, so I'm going to um, write on the other currency now, or, the, or rather, should I, should I say, I'm writing the Botswana Pula as the subject of the formula, just to show you that it's still going to give you the same answer as well. So if you made the Botswana Pula the subject of the formula, then I just have to go to the table and have a look. So 1,25. Um, where are we now? There we go. So if we have to change the subject of the formula, so one Botswana Pula is equal to one comma two five three four seven five. Okay, so I'm following the same steps now. I'm just using the other exchange rate. Okay. So we've got that one puller is equal to one comma two five three four seven five rands. Okay, I want the thirteen rand into pullers. So once again, I line up. And then I've got new over old times lonely. So I'm going to say thirteen divided by one comma two five times one and you'll get the same answer. Okay, so you, you should get the exact same answer no matter which exchange rate you do. Okay, and again, if you do the LVN method, same thing, you always start on the right-hand side. Okay, so like here, I started on the right, I'm going to start on the right hand side again and simply just divide and times. So 13 divided by 1,25 multiplied by 1 and you'll get the answer. So the LVN method is also a nice alternative as well if that works for you. But again, you need to remember steps. Okay, so your steps is you always start on the right hand side and then you work anti-clockwise divide and times always. So here, right hand side, divide and times. Here, right hand side, divide and times. But still the same setup that I have done. So write down the exchange rates, write down what you need, and then follow the steps. Okay, and I get you 10, comma 37. Okay, so that was question A. So now we need to carry on and have a look at question B. I'm just going to give you a second if you are writing down um, that step. Okay, then I'm going to carry on. I'm going to finish off question B. Okay, so question B says calculate the total number of UTM sold if a total profit of 7,526 pullers was made. Okay, so this is again quite a few a few steps. 
four marks. And this is a level three question, so it is a little bit more complicated. So I'm just going to show you on the memo how this question is um, done, because there are a few things I just want to make mention of here with this question. OK, so we want to work out how many units were sold. So this is my profit that I made. Now we know that profit is selling price minus cost price. OK, that gives us profit. So that's something that we just need to take into account. OK, then remember, this question is now folding in from the previous question. So we already have um, the selling price. We already have the cost price. The selling price we have from the actual wording of the question. So again, you need to just keep this in mind. Is that sometimes the information is in the previous question. So there we go, we've got our selling price. And then we've got our cost price as well, which we've just gone and worked out that 10,37. I mean, you need to remind yourself what it is that you're actually doing. So we've worked out our selling price and we've worked out our cost price. So in actual fact, we've got our profit. We just need to minus the two from one another. So I need to minus those two from each other. So I'm going to just quickly zoom in here. I want you just for now to ignore the 7,526 pullers, the profits. And I want you first just to focus on what it is that we're doing. So what the question wants us to do is it wants us to work out how many units were sold that we made that profit of 7,526 pullers. So this value over here. And like I said, let's just ignore that for a second. So what we needed to do first is we needed to actually work out how much profit we made on one. OK, because if we work out how much profit we made on one and we now know how many we made in total, we can just divide to get the answer. So the first thing we needed to do was we needed to minus the selling price and the cost price from one another. So when you minus the two from one another, you get that total of 37,63 pullers. OK, so that 37,63 pullers, that is the profit that is it John. Yeah, John and Errol made on their mouse. OK, the ultra thin mouse. So they, for one of them, they made a profit of 37,63, OK? But now, in total, we made 7,526. So now all you're going to do is you're going to divide the two values together, and then you're going to get an answer of 200, OK? So again, when you first read that question, it seems quite complicated, but you just have to take these concepts that you've learned over the years and put them all together. So at your selling price, it's minus your cost price, gives you a profit of 37,63 pullers. And I suppose also working with pullers also freaks you out a little bit, I'm sure. So if you really want to think of it as rands. OK, so 37,63 pullers that you made per mouse. So multiplied by something gave me the 7,526. OK, so multiplied by something. So in other words, how do we now go backwards? We have to divide those two values together to get a total of 200. Now, again, as you can see there, it's a CA from question 2.3.3A. So in other words, whatever you got in the previous answer, that 10,37, as long as you carried it through, you took your answer from there, you substituted it in, you got an answer, you divided, and you got your answer here, you will still get those four marks that we have for this question, as long as you still followed all the correct steps. So you simplified, Oh, sorry, you substituted, you simplified, you divided, and you simplified again. And you'll still get all four marks. So just because you made a, a mistake in the previous question doesn't mean that you'll then be penalized in the next question. So that's also very important to notice. Um, like I said, when you first look at the question, you, you, you think it's quite complicated and you wonder, but I don't have everything. But when you actually read through the question again, you'll see that you do. And I mean, that's why the subject is called mathematical literacy, because we do need to read. Um, so that's very, very important. Um, this is a level three question. And again, level three in paper one wasn't a massive um, part um, of, of paper one, but now obviously it will be 30, 30, 20, 20. So 20% 20 level three questions. So you can expect quite a few um, level three questions. I mean, 20% of 150. So that'll be your 30 marks. So you will see 30 marks um, level three and 30 marks uh, level four as well. Okay. Um, so that's that part. And then our good friend sharing in a ratio. OK, so grade 10, like I said, we focused on this in grade 10. Um, and then you don't really hear of it again. And then randomly in matric, you get a question like this. So very important just to make sure that you go through some of these, you know, golden oldies from grade 10. 
Calculate the amount in pullers that Errol will receive if a total profit of 7,526 pullers was made. So we want Errol. Okay, so now we need to just go back to the top and we need to just read again what the top is saying. So the top says that John and Errol then decided to share the profit in the ratio three to two. Okay, I'm zooming in quite nicely now. So John and Errol then decided to share their profit in the ratio three to two. So in other words, this one, the first one, the three is for John and the second one is Errol. So for every three parts that John gets, Errol will get two parts. So if John gets three rand, Errol will get two rand. So now we need to go, we need to share the 7,526 pullers between John and Errol. But the question is specifically asking us for Errol's share of the profit. Okay, so Errol only gets two out of the five parts. So where does the five parts come from? It comes from adding those two values together. Okay, so three plus two gives you five. But now because we want Errol's share of the profit, we're going to say two over five multiplied by 7,526. And then we're going to get a total of three, zero, one, zero, comma, 40 pullers. Um, another way that you could also do it is you can take the 7526, you can divide it by 5 because you're dividing it in by the 5 parts that it gets split into, but then Errol gets 2 parts. Um, you know, this is something that we teach grade 8s already, and then like I said, we, we refocus on it in grade 10. So not a difficult concept to understand, but like I said, I don't think many learners go back and practice it because it's not really something that educators put emphasis on. Um, in grade 12. So please yeah, go through little things like these as well. So, so keep your grade 10 mental textbook um, or, or workbook rather um, on standby. Okay, and then the last question of um, exchange rates, you need to show how the Algerian dinar of 0,104747 ZARS was obtained. Okay, so that is basically um, they want you to to show how you got to that answer over there. Okay, so now remember that the first column is one rand is equal to 9,54, but then this one is switched the other way around. So in other words, all we're going to do is we're going to take the one rand and we're going to divide it by the 9,54,6,7,8,5 dinars and then that is how you get to your answer. In other words, you're doing the reversal now to try and show how you get to the second column. Okay, that one is a little bit of an ugly question, considering the fact that um, learners don't enjoy when an exchange rate is written um, the, the other way around with the other currency as the subject of the formula. You guys prefer it when it's, um, you know, $1, 14 rand or whatever. Okay, so let's carry on now with interest. Let's see how far we get in the next 45 minutes. Okay, so this question is also taken from paper one, November 2019. So Josh saved 500 Rand each month since um, earning his first profit. He has now accumulated an amount of 17,000 Rand. Table two shows the simple interest rates that would have been earned over fixed time periods for amounts ranging from 10,000 to 99,999. Okay, so what's important here that I'm seeing is the fact that it's a simple interest rate. And remember with simple interest rates is that the same amount will be accumulated over time. All right, so if we have a look at this table, we can see the term in months ranges from six months all the way up to 48 months. And that there's also two columns here. The first column is for 10,000 to 24,999 Rand. And then the second column is for 25,000 to 99,999 Rand. So, yeah, hi. Yes, sir. All right. So, if you have a look now at this table, the first question is asking us to determine in months how long it took to save 17,000 Rand. So every single month he is Josh is saving 500 Rand into an account 
and over time it accumulates to 17,000. So if you wanted to go and work out how long it took him, how many months, and just be very careful there, the question is asking us to determine in months, so they want us to say how many months it took. So all you're going to do with that one is you're going to take the 17,000 Rand, you're going to divide it by the 500 Rand that he is saving every single month, and you get a total of 34 months. Okay, again, level one question. Okay, because it's quite straightforward there. You just take how much you accumulate to divide it by how much you put in every single month, and you get 34 months. Very important, that word months as well. So there's two marks allocated. Let's have a quick look here at the descriptors again. So the first mark is for dividing by the 500, and again, you can see it's a method accuracy mark. And then the second mark is then for your CA, for your simplification. So you need it to divide by 500 in order to get that first mark. Right, the next question is asking us to write down the interest rate he'll get if he invests his money for three years. Okay, so if you go back to the table again, Okay, question B. So the question is asking us the interest rate. So we need to go back to the table. So as you can see, he accumulated 17,000 Rand. So that means that he's falling into the first column. So already you can ignore the second column because he's going into the first column. The question is asking us specifically for three years. And as you can see, the table does not give it to us in years the table is giving it to us in months. So that means that he would need to first, oh, oh sorry, we would rather need to first go and just figure out which one that is. So the three years is how many months? So we're going to multiply that three years by 12. And then when you multiply that three years by 12, you will then see that we get 36 months. So now because we have the 36 months, we now know where we fall into, which is now obviously this one. And now we can go and read off and get the 8,30%. So B's answer, simply put, is 8,30%. Okay, then the next one, determine rounded to the nearest 100 Rand, the amount of interest that Josh will earn if he invests his accumulated savings for three years. So in other words, he gets his... Um, 17,000 Rand. Remember, he's, in, he's now gone and invested it for 34 months, as we already saw, but now he's going to go and invest it for three years, so that's now going to be 36 months. Okay, let me just get to the memo again. All my pages are now mixed up. Okay, there we go. So, the 17,000, he gets 8.3% per year, as you saw, okay, from the table. So, there's the table again. So, 36 months, 8.3% per year. Okay, so that one over there. So now we're going to go work it out. So if he earns 8.3% per year on his 17,000 Rand that he's now, remember he's accumulated. Remember he's added 500 Rand every single month for 34 months. And now he's going to go and see how much interest he gets. So 8.3% multiplied by the 17,000. That gives me a total of 1,411 Rand per year. But remember, it's simple interest. So simple interest is the same every single time. So every year or every month or whatever the case is. So we get a total of 4,233 Rand. But very, very important. Please, guys, don't forget about this. Is that very special rounding off mark. Okay. And as you can see here by the memo, the mark is specifically allocated for rounding off. So many of the learners, they work it out and they move on to the next question, but they did not actually go and read what the question was. As I say, highlighters, colorful pen will be your best friend during the exam. So if you have time in your test, which you should have a few minutes to spare, go through the questions a little bit slower and make sure that you're actually reading what the question said. The question said you need to round off to the nearest 100 Rand, okay? So a lot of you would have lost that last mark because you would have stopped at 4233 and you would have gone on to the next question. So we need to get rid of that 33 Rand there because the question said to the nearest 100 Rand. So the 33 Rand will obviously be closer then. So 233 Rand will be closer to 200 as opposed to 300 Rand. So therefore it'll be rounded off to 4,200 Rand. Okay, so please do not throw those marks away. Again, if you have 
an opportunity to work through past papers, especially in class time. Um, make sure that you go through the past papers properly, because especially when your educator marks it with you, I'm pretty sure you won't have access necessarily to the memo, um, you know, a, a physical copy of the memo. Um, the school obviously probably just put it on, you know, a visualizer or board like I'm currently doing now. But please, when your educator goes through the questions with you, or, or rather the answers with you, have a look at the memo and have a look at where the marks have been um, specifically allocated so that you learn to remind yourself to do things like rounding off, for example. Um, obviously, you can download a lot of these question papers, so go through the memo and especially the descriptors. It's so important. It really it teaches you a lot of skills, um, especially with small little marks that you could miss out on. But yes, rounding off is definitely one that sneaks in quite often. OK, so the next question, um, so FISO wants to invest 24,000 Rand for 48 months instead of 12 months. OK, so now we're not talking about Josh anymore. We're now moving on to Sufiso. So in other words, we are going to do a reading here from the table again. So he has 24,000 Rand, so he's still falling into the first column. All right, so not the second one yet. Um, we could definitely stay in the first one, but now he wants to compare basically the interest rate at 12 months with the interest rate at 48 months. So yeah, very easy question. We're just reading from a table. So we need to have a look at the 48 months value, which is the 8,46%. And then we need to have a look at the 12 months value, which is the 7,76%. So all we're going to do there is we're going to simply minus the two values from one another. So we're going to take the 846 and we're going to minus the 7,76. I'm going to say calculate the difference in percentage points for this interest rate. In other words, how much more is he getting if he invests for longer? So it'll be the 8,46 minus the 7,76. And that's all you're going to do for those for that question over there. So when you do that, you then get an answer of 0,7%. OK, so again, if you have to look at your descriptors, you would obviously then get a mark then for minusing the values together, but you'd only get the mark if you had both values correct. And then you get a mark then for the answer. So easy two marks. And in order to qualify for the CA mark again, I would assume that at least one of them must be correct. OK, and then also just very important, I'm just actually thinking of this now. The, the question says calculate the difference in percentage points. OK, so calculate. The difference. OK, so what a lot of the learners do is they take the word difference into a little bit more of a, uh, a different um, context. So they actually write down what the difference is. So they'll say something along the lines of one is a high rate and one is a low rate, for example, or the one rate is higher than the other rate. That's not what the question is asking. The question is asking us to calculate the difference. So they don't want you to write down in words what's the difference. They want you to actually go work out the value, the difference in value. So please. A lot of learners do do that in their answers. They actually go write down what the difference is. They'll say the one is very big and the other one is very small, or the one is 12 months, the one is 48 months. That's not what they're asking. They're asking us to calculate a difference. So please just make sure that you actually go and read what the question is asking. Very, very important. Right, and then the last one for interest asks us to write down the minimum number of years and months that a person must invest 25,000 Rand to earn an interest rate of 8,41%. Now again, look at the mark allocation, three marks. So now already you're thinking, okay, three marks just to write down a value. This doesn't seem right. Something must be wrong here, okay? So go back and look at the question again. So yes, we're going to put in a little bit of effort. We need to go and um, find the value first, but what's making it three marks here is because you need to find the value and then read it off. But then you also need to go and you need to write it in years and months, and that's the trick. OK, so again, the mark allocation does help you figure out what it is that they actually want. So they need to invest 25,000, which means we're now going to go back and we're going to go have a look at the table. But now we're going to have a look at the second column and they want us to earn an interest rate of 8,41. So you're going to have a look at this table and you're going to look for the 8,41%. OK. So there's the 8,41% right over there. So again, this is now where the three marks is coming from. 
because you have to first go and find it. So when you do go and find it, then you see that it's at 18 months. OK, but what's important to note is that the question didn't ask for 18 months. It asked us for years and months. So that's why it's three marks. And again, you see it's a level one question because it wasn't a difficult question, but there was a little bit of effort that needs to be made. So one mark for writing down 18 months from the table. And then from there, I guess you can call it a conversion mark in a way. So then converting it then to years and months. So therefore, it's one year and six months. So again, a lot of you would have written 18 months and you would have moved on with your life. OK. And you would have lost two marks for nothing. So please read the questions. It's so important. Obviously, you could not write 1.5 years, OK, which I think some of the learners would have also gone and done. Because writing 1.5 years is not writing it in years and months. So just, again, be mindful of that. OK, so for those of you that would have written 18 months and moved on, you'll see two marks gone. And keep in mind the previous question with the rounding off mark, some of you would have forgotten to round off. So that's three marks gone. So you're throwing away little marks um, as you go along because you're not actually reading what the question is asking from you. Some of you have may, may have seen this question before because it is obviously from a past paper. All right, so Nomsa is planning to visit Los Angeles for an educational conference. She'll be traveling from her hotel to the conference venue with an Uber taxi. So obviously Uber was quite a big deal. I mean, a couple of years back still is, but it obviously became a big thing. So it's very important to keep up with, you know, what is big and happening with the world because you never know, you might see something similar in your exam. So, for example, now an Uber um, table that some of you have obviously used, but maybe have never really taken note of when you when you get into an Uber. OK, so an Uber taxi is operated using two options as shown below. The first option is an upfront fare. OK, which has a base fare, in other words, a call out fee. And then the second part of it is the number of miles times by the per mile fare. Now, again, miles. Great. So this means that we're dealing with conversions possibly. Um, but, you know, she is visiting or wants to visit Los Angeles, which makes sense why we are dealing with miles, because obviously in America they still work with miles. OK, so some of you might have panicked because now you've got dollars and you've got miles that you have to deal with. But remember, it's basically the same as working with rands and kilometers. So you're still doing the same thing that you would have done had this been a South African table. So there's no need to panic if you see something a little bit different or something out of the ordinary. And then the second option is a post trip fare, which has your number of minutes multiplied by the per minute fare plus the number of miles times by the per mile fare. So as you can see, the second part of the the, the sum or the equation rather, sorry, um, is exactly the same. OK, so those two aspects are exactly the same. So now you just have to look at the base fare versus the number of minutes. OK, so let's carry on exploring this table before we even bother to look at the questions. So table two shows the different Uber taxis and their respective rates in Los Angeles for both upfront and post trip fare options, including an example of a 10 mile trip using the upfront fair option. So they even give us an example Okay, at the bottom of the table. So then there's our different options. So you've got your Uber X, your Uber Black and your Uber Lux option. And then you've got your different aspects. So you've got your base fare, you've got your per minute fare, per mile, your minimum and then your cancellation fee as well. OK, and then there they're giving you a total fare for a 10 mile trip using the upfront option. So they're giving you an example there. So obviously option one and then also then for 10 miles and in the minimum fare, they're just explaining it. OK, so the minimum fare is the lowest fare that one would be charged per trip. OK, so the first um, question they're asking us is to work out the missing value B. So we need to first go and actually allocate um, missing value B. Let me just quickly move this up. So missing value B is over here. OK, so all we have to do now is we need to use the upfront option. So upfront and obviously now we're using Uber Lux. OK, so we are doing pretty much what the first two had done. We're just doing it now for the Uber Lux. So if you have to have a look again at the upfront option, the upfront option is the base fare is on the screen. Yes. So you've got your base fare plus the number of miles multiplied by the per mile fare. And remember, this is for a 10 mile trip. So all we're going to do is we're going to locate 
the base fare, which is over there, the $20. And then we also need the per mile fare. So that's the $5. OK, so we've allocated or, or, or rather located, sorry, everything that we need to use. And now we can just go and substitute it into the formula. So the formula is your base fare plus the number of miles um, multiplied by the cost per mile. OK, so there we go. So we've got our $20, as I said, and then we can go and add our 10, which is our number of miles, multiplied by $5 per mile, and it gives us a total of $70. Okay, so again, look at those descriptors again. Two marks just for selecting the correct values, okay? So the $20, you're getting a mark, and the $5, you're getting a mark. And then the CA, obviously, for the answer. You can only get that CA if um, one value is wrong. So in other words, again, if both are wrong, you're going to get zero. Okay, you, if you wrote 50 plus 12, for example, there, you can't get one mark because you've done something completely, completely wrong. So you had to have had at least one of these values correct. So let's say you got the 20, but then you accidentally looked wrong in the table and you accidentally used the 0, 16, the per minute fare by mistake. So you had 10 multiplied by 0, 60 there instead. Then you would obviously forfeit that mark. That RT mark would go, but then you could still get a CA for your answer. So you would have then gotten, um, what's that then, $26. So you would have had two out of three. Okay, so there are still options if you make a few mistakes. Okay, so that's how we get to the answer of B, the $70. All right. Then we're going to have a look at this next question. OK, like I said, this is now paper two. So if you have a look there at the paper two questions, you've got your three marks, you've got your four marks, you've got your eight marks, and then you've got two marks. So again, I'm just thinking back to my class where my learners, as soon as they see eight marks, they're like, oh, and they move on. They don't want to do these eight mark questions. OK, but unfortunately, that is just how it's going to be. Again, I mean, the papers are a bit different, but it doesn't mean now that you're not going to have these longer questions because these are your level three and your level four type questions, so which you do still have. So you can still expect to get these long questions. But now the difference is you're going to get them in paper one and paper two and not just so much in paper two. OK, so 2.2.2 is saying that you need to calculate, round it off to the nearest mile. The maximum distance for which a person can use the Uber X taxi if you pay the minimum upfront fare. OK, so now we need to work out um, how many or, or the maximum distance that we're going to do. OK, so this means that we need to go and first look for Uber Black. OK, so Uber Black. And we just put the answer on here for you guys. Sorry, not Uber Black, Uber X. OK, so Uber X is this one over here. OK, and they want us to work out the maximum distance. So in other words, if we pay the minimum upfront, remember there is a minimum that we need to use. Okay, so the four comma six five dollars. All right. So we're gonna have to pay that irrespective. So because you're paying that, how far can you get? That's pretty much what the question is asking us for. So if that is the minimum fare, and remember we are using um, the Uber X option. So now we're gonna have our per mile fare as well of naught comma ninety. OK, so now we're not working on the minutes, we're working on the miles. Obviously, now we're just focusing on the miles. So in other words, we're going to take that four comma six five dollars and we're going to divide it by the naught comma ninety dollars per uh, mile, which means that we're going to get five comma one six six. So we're obviously then going to round it to five. So that's the minimum distance you can go before you need to obviously then start paying a little bit more. I hope that makes sense to everyone. OK, that is a level three question, so it is slightly more complicated. But again, if you had gone through the table properly and made sure that you understood what it was that the question was actually asking first, or rather what the what the information the question was giving us first, then it does help a lot um, when you're answering questions. OK, then the next one, our level four question and our eight marks. OK, and again, please do not feel despondent when you see marks like or eight marks, for example, like this, because when you actually go and you start doing the question, you'll see it, it actually wasn't that complicated. It was actually quite a nice question. Um, you just have to compare um, different options. So just because you see eight marks, don't feel like, OK, I'm going to move on. I'll come back to it later. Try the question. You'll see had we broken it up into smaller questions, you would have been fine. But now because you're putting it at eight marks, you suddenly start panicking. So don't do that. Just read it first and break it down. 
so the question is asking us, um, it's speaking about how norms is traveling a distance of 29,73 miles with Uber Black. The post tri um, trip option was used and the trip took one hour and nine minutes to complete. OK, so that's important post trip option Okay, for Uber Black. OK, so Uber Black needs to be highlighted. The post trip option needs to be highlighted. 29,73 miles needs to be highlighted and then the one hour and nine minutes needs to be highlighted. Please don't be like some of those learners who literally highlights the entire paper. Okay, highlight what's important. Okay, and then um, Norms has stated that she would have saved more than $20, so more than $20 if she'd used the upfront option. And we need to show, and again, this is very important, show the calculations whether her statement is correct. Very, very important because some learners go work it out and then they forget to write she's right or she's wrong or she's incorrect or she's correct. Or sometimes you have to justify. So you need to say um, because she used more or whatever, you need to explain what you're saying. And the learners forget to because they don't highlight the question and make sure they've actually answered what the question is asking. OK, so again, we're focusing just on Uber Black. And now we, all we're doing is we're just comparing the upfront fare versus the post trip fare. That's literally all we're doing. So if you have a look at the formulas again, the upfront fare has a base fare, which is a call out fee, and then the number of miles times by the per mile fare. And then the post trip has the number of minutes times by the per minute fare plus the number of miles times by the per mile fare. So we're just literally substituting into an equation or into a formula and writing down an amount and then coincidentally we also just have to compare them that's all we're doing so again if i'd asked you to work out the upfront fare first and then the post trip fare i wouldn't have had a problem but now i mesh it together and it causes a little bit more um, drama so please just make sure read the question see how much of it you can actually answer okay so if you go back to the memo all right not that one Okay, so first things first, the memo started with post trip. Again, doesn't matter if you did the upfront first and then the post trip. So the memo started with the post trip because of the fact that Normsa um, used the post trip and then they went to the up, um, upfront to compare. So the post trip says the um, number of minutes. So now that's the first problem that you have is that it's in one hour and nine minutes. So you have to first go and convert it to 69 minutes. So that's the first part. OK, so that's where your first mark is coming from, is that you needed to first go and make sure that it's in minutes, so the 69 minutes. OK, so that's done pretty much 99% of the way there. Now we need to go and actually find our values from our table. So the, remember, the post trip is the number of minutes times by the per minute fare. So again, if you go look at the table, the per minute fare for Uber Black, OK, is this one, the 0.45. And then the number of miles times by the per mile, so the 3,55. So try and remember those two values. OK, so we're going to multiply it by the 0, 0,45 by the 69, because that's the minute fare. And then we're going to multiply the 3,55 dollars per mile. So you get 31,05 dollars <throat> plus 105,5415 dollars. And then we add it together and we get 136 dollars um, and 59 cents. OK, so that is working it out via the post trip. So that's what Normsa did. That's the option that she took. OK, um, but then she said she realized that she would have saved more than $20 if she had just gone for the upfront option. OK, so now we need to go back to our table again, because remember our upfront option has a base um, fare, the base call out fare, plus the number of miles. So now we're not going to use the per minute fare. We're going to now go and use the per mile fare and then the base. So now we're going to use the eight. So that's now going to fall away for this part of the question. So you've got the eight dollars plus the twenty nine comma seven three times by three point five five. So remember again, this part over here is the same as this part over here. So what you're actually just comparing is the per minute fee versus paying an upfront fee. So obviously, if, if you think about it logically, the longer the trip, obviously, the more you're going to pay. So obviously, once you've passed eight dollars, then it makes sense. Then uh, sorry, let me rephrase this rather. If you pass eight dollars, then it makes sense. Then to go for the upfront option. So she was 
in the Uber for one hour, nine minutes. So her value for time was $31,05 um, $31 versus paying an $8 upfront cost. So the moment your time, your length in time is you know longer than an $8 trip, it makes more sense to go for the upfront cost. Okay, so the $8 plus the um, 105,5415 gives you 113,54 dollars. Okay, so there's the 136 versus the 113 gives you 23,05. And again, let's go back to what the question asked. The question is saying that she said that she would have saved more than 20 dollars. Okay if she had used the upfront option. So therefore, it's $23,05, which means that the statement is correct. Now, again, that wording is so important, okay? Go back to the question again, all right? The question saying she would have saved more than $20, okay? More than $20. So if the question had read differently, if the question had lost the words more than, and said would have saved $20, okay, then she would have been incorrect because she saved more than 20. Okay, so just look at what the question is asking you, how the question is worded, okay, the question saying would have saved more than $20. So if the question had said would have saved $20, then she would have been wrong, she would have been incorrect. And that's also what I'm saying, please make sure that you actually go and answer the question. Because again, if you have a look at the memo, there's a mark there for the opinion. OK, so you've now gone and you've forgotten to um, to write down the opinion. So you've lost another mark. So keep in mind, you forgot to round off in a previous question. Um, you forgot to write down one year, six months in the previous question. And then now this mark as well. So that's four marks gone. So it's very, very important to read what the question is asking. Four marks, it's starting to build up. OK. And then the last question for tariffs and for finance as well says that we need to explain the importance of a cancellation fee for the Uber service provider. OK, so there's a whole bunch of different options here. I'm sure many learners would have gone um, for the same the same answer or type of answer here. But as you can see, and sometimes it does look like this um, in the final when you go to memo discussions uh, at the end of the year where there's 101 different options. Mm -hmm. Uh, sometimes the one one questions memo is like a page and a half long just because of all the different options that, that they, they get to. So yeah, so to cover cost for, for idle or waste time, so obviously um, the, the guy's waiting for you, okay, in case you cancel the booking. So penalty for booking made if one does not finally use the vehicle. So again, time wasting. So again, the first two are actually quite the same. Um, to prevent hoax calls, okay, so you order an Uber for the fun of it and then just as a joke, okay, and you don't show up or whatever the case is, to cover petrol cost and wear and tear of the vehicle, that's quite an out-of-the-box um, way of thinking, but a very nice answer, and then for the company to make a profit, also a really nice, um, I'd, I'd say the last two is definitely more of a higher order way of thinking, so very nice um, answers here, different options available as well, so you see, um, there are different um, variations on the on the memo, so it's not limited to something specific. And obviously, if you write something a little bit different, the marker will use his or her discretion um, when we're awarding the marks or awarding the marks. Sorry, or they'd even go to um, a senior marker and ask them for their opinion as well. So, so opinion questions are always the most interesting questions to to mark, in my opinion. Okay. So if you have a look here, um, the first question over here, this is from a February, March question paper 2017. And I think I've also actually used this question once or twice before as well. So the question is asking us to study the following five descriptions. So the first one, A, says the sum of data set values divided by the number of data items. The second one is the middle value in the top half of the ordered set. The next one, number C, data values that are arranged in ascending or descending order. D, the middle value in the bottom half of the ordered data set. And then E, the middle value of the ordered data set. So now you need to match um, 4.1.1 and 4.1.2 with the letters um, that was given to us. Now, again, it would be a bonus if you knew what all of these were without even looking at what the question was asking. But for time purposes, we can just look at the ones that they're asking for. So 
is asking us for the median. So that one will be the letter E, the middle value of the ordered data set. Now again, read properly, because again, the first thing I did when I was working through this question is I said, oh, it's B, because I didn't read, I just quickly like skimmed through it and then I saw middle value. So immediately I went for B. But if you actually have a look at B, it says middle value in the top half of the ordered data set. So that's obviously one of our quartiles, which just so happens to be the answer for 4.1.2. So please just read the questions. Luckily, when I went to 4.1.2 and I started um, re reading it again, I realized, oh, wait a minute, it's actually that one is actually B's answer. So therefore, 4.1.1 is actually E. So luckily, um, they the questions 4.1.2's um, answer was actually there. Otherwise, I might have actually just skipped that completely. So yeah, so that's a level one question. Two marks, right or wrong. So if you got E for the first question and B for the second question, then you get your four marks there for, for that question. So there, unfortunately, it's right or it's wrong. And the next one, the box and whisker. Now, this is a paper one question from 2019. And very nice, uh, the box and whisker plot. And again, something that I really enjoy teaching. And the biggest reason why I enjoy teaching it so much is because once again, it's pretty much the only new thing besides tax that we do um, in grade 12. So yeah, that's also why I really enjoy these two topics specifically. So our mathematics learners, you would have obviously had exposure to um, the box and whisker plot. And in mathematics, you're actually expected to draw the box and whisker plot. But in mathematical literacy, you don't have to draw the box and whisk a lot. Um, you're only expected to interpret it. So um, your mathematics learners, you'll obviously know how to draw it, but the mathematical literacy learners, you don't have to draw one. So it's all good and well if your educator is teaching you how to draw it. It's a nice skill to have, but you will not be tested on, on how to actually go and, and draw the box and whisk a plot. All right, so this box and whisk a plot, they're even nice enough, they give you the values, okay? So let's just quickly go through this. We've got a few minutes left, so let's try and see how far we can get to this question. So um, we've got five things that we need to note about the box and whisker plot. So the first thing we've got here is these are our whiskers over here, and this is our box. So this part of the box and whisker plot over here, this is our minimum value. So in other words, our minimum value is sitting at 64, okay? These lines over here, these are our quartiles. So this is our Q1 or our lower quartile. This is our Q2 or our median, Q3 or our upper quartile, and then our maximum value. Okay, so it's also very important to, to note as well, something that the learners do make mistakes with this question is, um, <clears throat> sorry, my voice is now taking a bit of strain. Um, if the question was to go and ask for the minimum value, you can obviously see the answer is 64, but some learners will say 63. So they take the minimum value of the axis rather than of the start of the box and whisker plot. And the same for the maximum, they might have said 85 instead of 84. Okay, so that's just very important to notice that when we're asking you for a five number summary, for example, that the minimum value is the start of the whisker and then the maximum value is the end. So it's not necessarily the minimum value of the graph on the axis. So very, very important over there. Um, yeah, so it's very important to know what each one represents. In other words, minimum Q1, Q2, Q3, and the maximum. But it's also very, very important to understand what the box and the whisker plot is actually doing. So what it's doing is it's just putting the data into four pieces, okay? So it's breaking it up into 25%. So this is your first 25%, right? This is your next 25%, your next 25%, and then your last 25%. So it's splitting the data up into four pieces of 25% each. So in other words, I mean, this is a typical paper one type question, but if you just have to go into more detail about it, you can see here, that this is a lot bigger than this piece here, which means that this 25%, the data is a lot more spread out. And you can see that it's going from 69 to 80. So there's a lot wider spread between these data values than it is with these data values. Here it's only going from 66 to 69. So there's only a 3% difference in this section, this 25%, where in this section there is a 11% difference. So 
it's very important to to note this. So this is 25% of the data, 25%, 25%, and 25% of the data. So it's a lot more spread out here, where the first 50% is a lot more put together, and this 50% is a lot more variation. Okay. So let's just have a look here. We're talking about the National Senior Certificates in 2018. And this is the average pass percentages for mathematical literacy. How nice. Okay. So the first um, question, 1.3.1, is asking us to write down the pass percentage that represents the following, the median. Okay. So the median is easy. You'll just say 69, or you can even say 69% because it so it's talking about um, a percentage. So whether you write 69 or 69%, you will get the two marks. And again, this is a level one question because you're just reading um, off of the box and whisker plot. So again, they were nice enough. They gave you the values. They could have maybe just given you a few values and then you would have had to go and count, but they actually gave you the values, which made it a little bit um, easier for you to do. And then the next question, quartile three. So again, you needed to know what all of these represented in order to know what quartile three was. So that'll be your 80%. So although the question was very easy, you still had to do the work and actually know what each thing meant. OK, and then determine the difference between the highest and the lowest pass percentage. In other words, this question is actually just asking us for the range. OK, so that's all they're asking us for, the range. So in other words, your highest value minus your lowest value. So again, two marks here because you need to go and allocate. Or oh, sorry, I don't know why I keep saying allocate, but you need to go and find the values. OK, so 84% and 64%. So 84 minus 64, and that gives us a total of 20%. So I'm just going to have a look at the descriptors here again. Very important. And you see these are all level one questions from various papers. So your, your value for E, your value for B is two marks each for getting it correct. The 69% is two marks, the 80% is two marks. Okay, again, right or wrong, there's no leniency here, you can see that. And then the last part, the 84 minus the 64, which gives us 20%. Okay, so one mark, um, the RT mark for both correct values, and then one mark simplification. So again, if one of these values is wrong, um, your CA mark can still happen, but it all depends on what it is that you're minusing. If you were to go and minus, um, let's say your interquartile range Q3 minus Q1, then you wouldn't get marks for that because that's not what the question asked. So yeah, in other words, this question is pretty much a right or wrong question. All right, is there any questions? Um, unfortunately, yeah, I can't get through the rest right now, but I'm more than happy to, to carry on with this section quickly on Thursday before going on to maps and measurements. 